Welcome to the Market Maker Podcast, hosted by me, Anthony Chung, where every Friday I talk to a member of the team about what happened in markets this week. From macro themes and single stock news to cryptocurrencies and careers in finance, our aim is simple, to make finance interesting and easy to understand for everyone. So let's get to it. Hello and welcome to episode 78 of the Market Maker Podcast, where I'm joined as ever by my partner in crime, co-founder of Amplified Peers, Curran. And this week, we are going to focus on a couple of things. The two key themes are going to be the economic challenges being faced in China after they surprised markets this week. They cut rates. And also, we're going to talk about the revenge of the meme stocks, as reports have circulated that short sellers have lost an estimated $1.65 billion in just one month. Before we begin, though, a couple of things I uh, just wanted to talk about, Piers, before we go into the, the nuts and bolts of the week, and then those two stories, uh, is, a, is a congratulations to everyone who's got their A-level results. Um, I, I did pop into town yesterday. I saw a lot of people carrying brown envelopes and either looking yeah. euphoric or depressed. <laughs> but yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, if you didn't get the grades that you were hoping for, and one thing, actually, I was looking at a couple of stats this morning. Um, there was an artificial bump up through teacher assessed results in A-levels over the two years on COVID. And actually, results have gone down as a overall this year. So right. I think that perhaps then there's possibly more disappointed people this time round, given yeah. that they might have done well in their marks and so on, but the sitting exams now. Uh, and just wanted to say, just don't beat yourself up like um i did shockingly bad in my a levels <laughs> i had to go through clearing uh i had to kind of beg and plead to get into a non-target uni <laughs> <laughs> and uh i remember <laughs> rocking up on day one and i was sat there talking to who became my best friend still to this day and i was like what grades did you get and he went a a b and i went oh my god uh. you just solved <laughs> <laughs> because i didn't even get half that <laughs> i feel sorry for you having to sit beside me but um yeah there's the, the, just the thing i wanted to say was look i mean it's not the end of the world and far from it um yeah it's it's difficult for like when you're going through life though it is hard because ultimately what, whatever the whatever challenge you're currently on feels like well, it's the most important challenge you've ever had. And the outcome of that challenge is the most important thing ever in your life. So I'm talking about like, obviously, younger people coming, come, going up the ladder, like GCSEs, right? When you're doing your GCSEs, it's like, oh, my God, this is, this is the be all or end all. And it's the most important thing that's ever happened. And so obviously, the pressure's there, then it's A-levels, right? And then when you're doing your A-levels, you think, well, actually, yeah, that GCSE thing. What, what was I worrying about? And A levels becomes the next thing. And then you're in. If you if you go to university, you're then like, all oh, right, wow. You know, forget A levels. Actually, it's my degree now that's the most important thing. And there's always this cycle. And yeah, it's it's so it's very difficult. Like when you're telling a younger person, if you're telling, you know, writing a letter to your younger self, mm. and you say, look, guys, just don't don't worry. It's not as important as you believe it is in this moment. I mean, it's easy and fine to say that, but it's incredibly difficult to actually, you're the 18 year old to really appreciate and understand what you're talking about. Um, I mean, and, and I also think that, um, you know, just going through life, success, 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 success. Hmm. I, I, honestly, I don't think, ironically, I don't think that's the best path because I think you need some kind of setback. You need some kind of, it doesn't have to be a failure, but a setback where an outcome has, is not what you wanted. And then having to deal with that, I think is uh, an incredibly important life experience that you can then take with you. You know, when you, mm. when you get past all of these qualifications and jump over these hurdles that are put in front of you and you actually get into the world of work, then you know, work's not plain sailing, right? Especially it depends what role you do. But like in my experience, markets-based roles, 
um, there's huge, there's huge downs. Um, you know, there's huge failure. There's huge disaster when it comes to P and L swings. And you know, I honestly think dealing with some of my setbacks in my early years actually really equipped me much better to be able to then deal with those situations. So one of the biggest kind of failures I had, or wake, I'll call it a wake up call, because I I did. I actually did well in my A levels, and I and I like did better than much better than I was expecting. Let's put it that way. Um, and so great, happy days. Went to university. I actually took a year out, so I didn't. So I, I took a year out, and that that was perhaps my error because I went. I did engineering, so it's quite a a technical degree subject, um, and I I started at uni, and and like they said, right. First, first week of my degree program, right? We're going to revise the whole of A level maths in one week, and then we're going to have a test at the end of the week. And I'd done nothing in terms of maths for over 12 months, right? A load of the people on the course hadn't had a year out. And um, I got some great Greek friends who are still my good friends to this day. And the Greeks, they're just geniuses when it comes to maths, right? And I did this first week. And I think I got 23% in the maths test at the end of the week. And I was like flailing. I was drowning in the deep end, basically. And my Greek mate got 99%. <laughs> and it's like, what? And that was like one wake up call. Then the end of that first year, um, I did, a, we had our end of year exams. And for me, most, most degree subjects, first year doesn't count or it doesn't matter so much. For me, it counted to my degree and actually to the point where if you didn't pass all of your modules, then you, you're kicked out. Um, and one module I didn't pass, I, it was uh, fluid dynamics. Uh, and I got 27%. And I honestly thought I'd smashed it and done really well. And I got 27%. I said, I, said, you, you, I demand a remark. They remarked it 26%. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, okay. Uh, and so you do a retake, right? Mm. That's your last chance. If you fail the retake, you're out. They literally kick you out. And you have to get 70% in the retake to stay in. And that was like my biggest, that was the big one where I had to go back and really cram. And actually then I understood that I'd completely misunderstood the, the concepts and the topics. Anyway, past the retake um, somehow, and then fine, I was off and running. But it was that kind of reality check, that kind of getting smashed in the face. Wow, okay, I'm not, I'm not very good. Mm. Um, actually, I need to up my game here. And, and kind of dealing with that, I think definitely those life experiences can be seriously valuable. So if you're sat there with A-level results that aren't what you wanted, then... I know it's hard in the moment right now to appreciate this, but, you know, these are great challenges to go at. You know, you are where you are. It is what it is. It can't be changed now. So now mm. you take what you've got and you move forwards as best, you know, you can. And and and, and you'll learn great things from this. Yeah, and a couple of um, stats that I thought were quite interesting uh, on this on this topic. In London, 39% of A-levels were graded A-star and A as compared to 30% of exam grades in the northeast of England. So there's almost a 10% gap there. Um, the actual marking body, 58% of private school candidates in England were awarded an A star or an A. State school pupils, 30%. So it's wow. half. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And, and, and I was just I'm shocked surprised. when I saw that. Like ah. geographically, it's just insane. And then, yeah, looking at the difference in yeah independent school all the way, kind of going downward, it was yeah. There's a big, big divide there in the results. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, what this is one of the things why I think you know I'm super excited about the simulations and the tech that we do because you know I was definitely part of the the state school system and i guess my grades were a function of that they were fine but fine would be terrible probably at a private school right yeah um and so yeah if it, you know all the other things though that i was doing 
external to then studying because I used to basically play sport half the time, study half the time, meant that all of the characteristics I think that I had. So you mentioned things like resilience, things yeah. like that. They're just built in <laughs> yeah. from a very young age. And so, um, yeah, through, you know, if you haven't done it yet, like our finance accelerator, which is our kind of introduction to, to kind of markets. And even if you've never scored well on an exam, even if you don't have an A-level to your name, like you should just get involved. Like who knows? You could just have this natural ability. And I honestly believe the job that I'd done for the first part of my career, I'd sit there and my job was basically to be quarterback for traders. I'm watching yeah. the game unfold and I'm calling out the plays so that traders can then trade and execute. When I think about that in the role I facilitate in the sport I played is exactly the same role. Right. <laughs> it's just like, in a different, you know, context. That was all. Um, a lot of the actual core principles of the innate skills I was using were the same. Um, yeah. Little did I know because of a lack of education about the application of my skills which again, we try to address, of course, with the simulation and why people, I think, might be surprised about what they're good at and what they're bad at. Um, and then the fact that a lot of it was non-technical because I was communicating. My job was to communicate. And communication, yeah. given my background, felt quite quite natural in that way. Um, well, you, you always hear people talk about, and I'm definitely in this camp, say that what they learned at university uh, that, that nothing from what I learned at university have I used in my job, like nothing. So it kind of goes back to the point, well, it's a bit, it's a bit flawed, this system where you're recruited based on your university grades or your A-level grades, when actually that's measuring something that's not related to your ability to do a job. So the system's broken, and, and this is what we're trying to, you know, our big mission at Amplify is to try and fix it by creating a simulation that simulates the job and actually measures how your, your potential to perform in that role, and that's how you should get hired, not whether did you get a 2-1 in, in your degree. Um, and there was some great news this week from PwC. Um, the big accounting giant who have scrapped that. So up until this point, they'd had a minimum requirement for their new hires to have at least a 2-1 uh, degree score. And they've just scrapped it. And they said, we, we no longer require a, a minimum degree score. And this is all about just trying to, well, recognize a few things. What, what I've just said, maybe, that actually your degree doesn't necessarily measure your ability to do the role, but it also ties into your other point around the, you know, that gap between the rich and the less well-off and mm. how the education system right. is unfair because the rich go to public school where the education seems to be much better mm. and the the less well off are at state schools. And so you can't compare like for like. So that's why these single, you know, grades from these exams, you know, whilst it's of interest, it is definitely not really measuring what's more important. And that's your ability to do the role. Yeah. And then, you know, that, that move by PwC, I think that that is addressing much more um, of, of a credible solution to this diversity challenge that all corporations have so it isn't just like okay we run these very targeted ethnicity type days and things like that it's no it's like you know from a social economic perspective which does then feed down into ethnic group groupings yeah it's look we, you know it, it isn't equal <laughs> the yeah. opportunity is not the same and so therefore you know I, I think their move is yeah i applaud it and i think it's a really positive thing so yeah, and they won't be the last. I think this is this is just the tipping point. Yeah, cool. Well, look, let's move in to the news section first to go over a couple of highlights of the week before we delve into to China and the meme stocks. So starting off with the UK, and I'm afraid 
I'm going to sound like a broken record. UK inflation hits 10.1%. So we're now at the first double digit print in 40 years. You shouldn't be shocked by that. That number is going to go, unfortunately, well north of that. The thing here, though, is that surging inflation has resulted in the fastest fall in real pay on record. Consumer confidence then this morning has now fallen to its lowest since 1974. And just to throw in to boot, UK retail sales as we can expect it the year on year as well this morning. Um, so yeah, it's all looking rosy in the UK at the moment. Um, <laughs> nothing yeah. much really more to add. It's more of a continuation. And I and I guess that definitely conscious of the fact that there are some severe challenges for, you know, forget markets for just people's lives at this point in time. And you know, don't want to belittle that at all. But you know, things are going to get progressively worse during the coming months as we go particularly into the inflation peak which is anticipated around october uh, and we talked about i think market pricing was like 150 or so um 150 more basis points to price in i think that went up to 200 plus following the inflation print because it was higher than expected which means we might overshoot as yeah. we have done on every step the bank of england's forward guidance so if we get to 14 15 that would be, I think, um, not entirely surprising, but would further mean that the market does need to recalibrate even further, because at the moment we're not set that high. So that was the UK, but we won't we won't dwell on that for too much longer. The other thing was Saudi Aramco. Um, I don't know if you caught. I, I shared with our community a, a, a fantastic graphic, and so basically Saudi Aramco has posted a ninety. 90 percent rise in their Q2 profits as a second straight quarterly record, and the graphic basically showed their net income, which was forty eight point four billion US dollars. That was more than the net profit at Microsoft, Apple, Meta Platforms, Tesla combined. Yeah, you might have heard of those names. <laughs> but I have to say, when I was reading the, because this was in our market maker daily market maker newsletter uh if you're if you're not a subscriber then what what are you playing at go and uh, go and get subscribed at amplifyme.com but i was reading that that piece and i looked at that chart and it actually there's very few charts that kind of shock me just because i'm really old <laughs> and i've seen a lot of stuff um and that chart really did i, I thought what is that true and i kind of drilled in and did a bit of analysis and it is i mean yeah the saudi aramco profit bigger than microsoft apple and meta combined i mean i'm not including tesla their profit's not that big um but because apple's profit was 19.4 billion mm. um but yeah saudi aramco 48 just a casual 48 billion but uh, that's I mean, just in three months by the way the, the con context though is that yeah like the the consistency of the profit generation at an apple is different right because all oil majors have hit records shell BP, this is true uh total energies like they've all smashed it given what's been going on yeah it's good times i mean yeah to put that into context their q2 profit in 2020 right was 7 billion oh okay yeah, yeah. not not 48 it was 7 billion which was right. Yeah, so you're right. The consistency of, uh, look, that's the nature of the beast, right? They're selling oil and that pr the price of oil is very volatile. So yeah, their revenues are very volatile. Um, well, look, talking of Apple and talking of consistency, is that what the rationale is then for Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway? Now he's topped up his stakes. So there's something called the 13F filings that all came out this week. And that allows us to see these fund managers and, changes to the composition of the the companies they're invested in essentially and we can look at who they've come out of who they've gone into and it allows us to see the kind of bullish bearish appetite they have you know it gives us a little bit of a granular you know, individual micro level but also a macro kind of view on the world as well and he's topped up his stake in apple a couple of things here um he 
it now apple makes up 41 percent of his portfolio when i read that i was like i've read that wrong surely that's a typo 41 yeah. percent like yeah i understand that he now he basically owns 5.6 percent of apple which is pretty mind-blowing we are talking about a multiple trillion dollar company and he owns 5.6 percent his dividend income is 800 million bucks was the, was the figure I saw, 800 million um, in a year, which is insane. But 41%, surely that's not sensible. Even yeah. for a cash cow juggernaut consistent Apple. I, there's a few angles here. Um, if you believe in Apple long term, which clearly he does, then quarter two was a really good time to buy buy more because quarter two was when we saw, you know, the big tech giants, you know, their share prices starting to really, you know, get hammered. I think Apple topped out in the last year at $178. And then in quarter two, it bottomed out at 135. Um, you know, so that's like a 20 plus percent sell-off. So, you know, if you're a long-term believer, you're buying dips, right? So that's what Buffett's just done. Um, so that's one point. The other point, yeah, on the face of it, that 43% of his portfolio, that seems incredibly, well, we, we always use the word diversification in portfolio management and in the asset management world. And diversification is key. You know, spread your money across lots of different um, companies because you never know. It doesn't matter how good a company may look. There's you know, there's skeletons in the closet and stuff can happen. You know, think BP and the Horizon disaster in 2010. Think the Volkswagen emissions, uh, emissions scandal, you know, and there's others, right? And so you never know. So you, you should really be spreading your money. So from a diversification point of view, yeah, this doesn't look good. However, in his defense, I mean, if you go back three years, the share price of Apple has more than tripled. So it's been an amazing trade. And the, the fact Apple's done so well has meant that the proportion of his portfolio that's made up by Apple has been increasing and increasing and increasing. So, yeah. Um, and, then, and then the other issue he has, more, than, more so than most other people on the planet, he's got a real problem with the size of his positions because he's got a liquidity issue. How, how do you get out of these kind of trades? Um, and so even if you wanted to kind of book some profit, then unfortunately his position is so large that engineering a way out of that would cause a big sell-off. So it's a bit like that Elon Musk situation with his Tesla holding that we've been talking about over the years. So I've got one more thing about Apple, and that is the index weighting. 7.3% now for the S&P 500 is the largest weighting for an individual company going back to 1980. So all those previous peaks that we've had, whomever they might have been, Microsoft or IBM yeah. or whomever, no one's ever been this big. Um, but a stat I thought was quite interesting, and you've talked about this before, Apple has bought back... $522 billion in stock over a 10-year period. That figure in itself is greater than the market cap of 494 companies in the S&P 500 alone. <laughs> That's a good stat. That's, I like that a lot. <laughs> All right. Well, look, we'll move, we'll move on. And I want to tell you what Tom Cruise has got to do with Airbnb. That's well, I know, I, well, again... <laughs> If you are a subscriber to our daily market maker newsletter, you'd, you'd know yeah. the answer to this. Yeah. Or if you know Tom Cruise, because what's <laughs> happened here is Airbnb. I love this uh, headline. They've introduced new anti-party technology. They're rolling it out in US and Canada. And it's just funny because I've definitely been there tasked with being the best man for a wedding. And you're like, Oh, I've got, I've got to fit like 20 blokes <laughs> in a flat. I can't tell them that I'm going to put 20, 20 geezers in a flat for a weekend of like debauchery. So 
what do you do? You're like, oh, no, it's just like uh, we're all uh, alumni friends from our college and we're having a catch up <laughs> on something more reasonable. <laughs> um, but actually what Airbnb are doing now is they've got a new system where they're going to look at factors like history of positive reviews or lack of the length of a time a guest has been on Airbnb, length of trip, distance to the listing, weekend versus weekday, amongst other factors. But this got me thinking about, obviously, Tom Cruise's minority report, <laughs> right? And the reason for that, if you haven't seen that film, is like here, there's that saying, right, of, innocent until proven guilty right Here, not we're saying you're guilty <laughs> until yeah. proven innocent <laughs> you're basically saying that your previous behavior dictates then that you are you're making a judgment before something has even happened i'm not sure how comfortable i feel about that judgment of using that technology in that way um you know if you ever if you believe in like reforming in like uh, a prison structure yep. sense it's like you're basically saying with this technology that no you've offended you should never be trusted ever again and we will not lend our services to you it's kind of like i, d I don't know i don't i read that and i was like well okay it's quite a funny headline but i was like mm, I... yeah but then can't you but i guess you need to build up your approval rating if it's that bad, then obviously you have um, been to too many stag do's. <laughs> and so you need to go on a weekend with your girlfriend for a, a yeah, few weekends. Now I can't with your book the nice weekend with oh, my I girlfriend. See what you mean. Okay, yeah. And even yeah, though so... I've got a genuine intention, right, got it. I want to have a nice, sophisticated weekend away with my partner, but the system has blacklisted me now yeah. because of my previous behavior. Yeah. Not yeah, sure. you've got a point. I also think that that's got to be the worst or, or the least popular bit of technology I've ever heard of. <laughs> the anti-party technology. No one wants that. I no, mean, they, they, no need, they need to have a sub-listing within the website where it's like, fill your boots, party time, Airbnb <laughs> rentals, where you can just go and mental. Right, <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that, well, that's actually a very good point. Now there's a bit of a gap in the market, isn't there? Okay, so yeah. Well, what should we do seed, seed round or how are we going to do it? <laughs> yeah. Um, the, other, the other kind of funny headline was uh, Manchester United, the football club. <laughs> because <laughs> earlier this week, their uh, shares in pre-market trade, because they're listed, I think they're listed in New York, they momentarily popped... 17% following a tweet from none other than your man, Elon Musk, who basically <laughs> tweeted, amongst other things, oh, yeah, I'm going to buy Man United, by the way. And their shares popped nearly 20% <laughs> until then. And classic Musk, he left it hanging for, I think, four hours. How was it that long? And then he came out and said, ah, you know, I'm just kidding, of course. And then obviously it reversed course. I think their shares actually were up on that day about three or four percent because the Glazier family are considering selling a minority stake in the club. There's lots of rumors going around. Um, but yeah, I just thought, what a world. <laughs> the, the power, the power of the musk. Um, um, and then the final, the final one, a little bit more on a serious note um on geopolitics was that chinese president xi has come to light this morning uh, on bloomberg is going to meet with russian leader vladimir putin they're both planning on attending in person the g20 summit in november the end of the year the presence of xi and putin at the meeting sets up a bit of a showdown of course because joe biden's going to be there as well as other democratic leaders and all of whom have not met in person at all since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Not have you had all of them in the same room, China, Russia, Putin, Biden, and everyone else. So that's going to be an interesting event. <laughs> yeah. Well, so what's the date for that? Sorry? Uh, November. Right. I'm sure the exact date. Can't remember now, but yeah, there's a little way to run. But God, Joe, Joe, Sleepy Joe's got a busy November. Yeah. With the midterms that month as well. All going off. Yeah. And you've got the the Communist Party's Congress as well. So oh, yeah. True. Yeah. 
But look, let's talk about China yeah. because they surprised the market earlier this week. They cut their medium term lending rate for one year loans in the banking system by 10 basis points. That level now is at 2.75%. It's the first cut since January, at the start of the year. Um, official statistics early in the week reflected worse than expected consumer and factory activity. And one stat that a lot of the wires were pumping was the fact that youth unemployment in China now is nearly 20%. Um, so there's a lot of pressure points at the moment on Xi Jinping's administration to reinvigorate this economy. So whether through traditional forms, stimulus through fiscal um, building, essentially, and funding, yeah. or through monetary means. But this has led to the likes of Goldman's have come out this week. Uh, Nomura have come out. They've cut their outlook on China. Again, I should say, this isn't like a new thing. They're just continuing to downgrade them. Um, the rationale at Goldman's was weaker demand, uncertainty stemming from zero COVID. That's still very prominent at the moment, several regions across China. And then the energy crunch. Um, actually, there's a heat wave yeah. at the moment, much like <laughs> everywhere in the world. Um, and that's causing energy sh shortages in several provinces, forcing factories to, sh to actually shut down. Um, so from a growth perspective, Goldman lowered their full-year growth forecast for China for this year to 3%. They were previously looking around 33 Nomura slashed it to 2.8, so even more bearish. Uh, yeah. I think what China's goal is, is it five now, five and a half. So it's five and a half. Yeah, yeah they're, they're significantly below what Beijing is is saying. So, yeah, what are your thoughts on these these developments this week? Um, well, yeah, they, they, well, China's uh, it's obviously a huge piece in the jigsaw of the global economic system, uh, second biggest economy. Um, and so, you know, if you're an investor anywhere on the planet, then China should be right at the top of your list of risks. And what we have is, uh, I, I would say, um, a steadily and progressively worsening uh, environment. And you've just put the stats there. So they themselves have a 5.5% uh, growth target for, for this year. So at this IKEA, what happened was there was uh, someone got detected, someone was in the shop, and it, and it turned out that they had been in proximity to someone else that had now been tested positive, right? And all of a sudden, the kind of the shop went into lockdown because their, their principle for zero tolerance is right. Any cases found, lock down that site immediately, no one in or out, and then shift everyone in that location to quarantine. So in this IKEA, it's like suddenly the lockdown process started and it triggered this massive stampede, people trying to fight their way out of the shop. Quite, trying quite to fight. a good shop to be locked in. Like I'd say, <laughs> you don't need to quarantine me. I've got a bedroom, I've got a kitchen, I've got meatballs, I've got everything I need. <laughs> oh, meatballs for a month, <laughs> sign me up. Um, but they were, they were like, like stampeding and trying to fight past the security cards to get out. So the point here is that they're now living in this environment. Yes, yes, lockdowns have gone. Well, unless you're in these islands or whatever. But but now there's a fear that you're going to get trapped and shoved off to quarantine. So actually, there's a reluctance to go out. So the retail spending boom post lockdown has not happened. And so no one foresaw this, right? And so it's really, I think, yet another kind of chapter in what I personally think is a, has been a, a really bad strategy from China. This zero COVID tolerance thing. I think in, when, when COVID hit in 2020, it looked amazing the way they dealt with it. And it definitely, almost certainly reduced the number of deaths, which is clearly a fantastic thing. But now this is turning into a nightmare. And it's turning into a nightmare for the people living in that country. And it's turning into a progressively worse um, kind of economic situation. 
And I think now it's becoming super bad and, and they're just reluctant to change. That's the thing. Xi Jinping doesn't want to step down and say, all right, guys, you know, perhaps we have got this wrong. Let's kind of pivot in this direction because that is a sign of weakness. And obviously he doesn't want to be seen as getting things wrong and being weak. Um, so they've got a particularly difficult economic situation. Um, this is feeding into the housing market. And this is perhaps where the big risk lies, in, in my view. Um, basically, I mean, you, you've kind of been reading about the housing situation, but um, what happened this week, which was of note, there's a big company called Country Garden, which is one of the biggest Chinese property developers. But they're, that, they're like, they're, they're supposed to be the healthy ones, right? They're the least risky um, but they reported earnings this week, and for the first half of the year, their profits were down 70%, which I guess isn't a surprise, right? But Fitch, which is one of the global ratings agencies that kind of rate the quality of corporate debt and, and essentially give a score as to how creditworthy these, these corporate borrowers are. So Fitch downgraded um, country garden into junk status. This was on Tuesday. Um, Cause up until this point, because of their rating country garden have been able to tap into foreign investment when they're issuing bonds to raise capital Well, that the rugs just been pulled out. So they, they've kind of, I would say lost access to foreign markets now. So what's, what's happening in the, in the property market? Well, sales are down in July, sales are down 28% year over year which means now prices are starting to drop sharply. To give you an idea of the square footage or square meterage, so um, in, uh, on average, in, 20, in quarter two of 2021, on average, property developers sold 156 million square meters per month. In quarter two of 2022, it's down by, well, yeah, it's down 106 million square meters. Per month um so you know obviously the the situation is incredibly distressed and obviously we're worried about what happens now and do we get defaults and we've seen the central bank cut interest rates but the problem there is it's probably not going to have any impact because you know, the whole thing around cutting interest rates is to try and encourage people to borrow more and then spend more it's supposed to boost demand right but they're cutting rates. There's just no demand for people. People don't want to borrow. So you can cut rates all you want. But if ultimately it's broken in terms of demand on the, on the credit side, then it has very little effect. So I would say we're kind of back to this point where it's only really fiscal policy that can turn this around. And what their appetite is to bail out the housing market, well, at the moment, they're kind of dragging their heels. They have told China bond issuance, that's the state-owned credit insurer, they've told them, to, the government's told them to underwrite bond sales by a handful of private um, developers. Um, so people like Longfor Group and so on, who are, who are very distressed. Um, they're also now taught there's rumors there's going to be some kind of rescue fund that's in the order of about 300 billion yuan for property developers. Um, but they've, they've fallen short of going, uh, of kind of backstopping. Because basically the problem is a lot of people, a lot of consumers have bought houses off plan and now are paying mortgages. You know, they've taken a mortgage out to buy that property off plan, but now the property is not being built because... The property developer is in a serious distressed situation and doesn't have any money and can't borrow any money. And they're being so desperate. They're, they're kind of borrowing money off local governments at crazy rates. But, but ultimately, you know, there needs to be some kind of bailout situation. And it's a trickle down effect because local governments are very dependent on revenue that comes from selling land to property developers. But property developers aren't buying land anymore. And the regional governments, it's thought that about 30% of their revenue has been from land sales over the last few years. That's just gone. So now the local governments are having to borrow money to, to plug the cash flow shortfall. And they're borrowing at 9% when the government's bonds are yielding 3%. Um, 
so as this thing progressively unfolds, you know, it's either you're going to get mass casualties where the big developers are going to go bankrupt, uh, consumers are going to lose a lot of money because there's people sat there with huge mortgages and no property. And if that property doesn't materialize, then they're screwed. Um, so the government at some point is going to have to step in and we're just not quite sure how big the bat is going to be when they come and, and step in. So that's the big kind of, that could be the straw that breaks the camel's back, right? What happens in the property market and how does the government um, decide to deal with it? So, so beyond China then, let's say that the, <clears throat> the risks are accumulating at the moment. And so what about the Fed and the bigger, broader global economy beyond the current inflationary pressures that are mounting now and we're yet to determine peak or not? What about in 2023 if then we see the full slowdown coming from China, worst case, does materialize and demand just drops globally on the back of the Chinese situation? Are we going to end up in a situation where inflation is going to turn into deflation, growth is going to slow spectacularly on a global level? What, what are your thoughts on the kind of more the, the, the nature of how that could impact then onto the Fed? Yep. Over I mean, a 12, 18 months period. Right. So China's, as I was saying, huge. So if China have a big kind of crisis, then it's going to impact everyone on the planet, even the US. Okay. What just in the short term, from that inflation angle, everyone's suffering from this inflation crisis. There is, uh, ironically, a little bit of a positive spin you can put on this China situation in terms of their housing, their property sector being so distressed. There's a positive spin you can in the short term. And that is that this is good news for the inflation problem globally. It's just because China's such a huge buyer of commodities, right? The, the biggest buyer of, of commodities. I mean, for example, China buys two thirds of the world's iron ore. Two thirds of the entire planet's iron ore sales goes to China. Okay, um, coal is it's about four, you know it's about half of the coal demand. Copper even China buys forty percent of the world's copper. Now, if China are suffering, certainly on that iron ore side in the construction sector, then this, the demand side for iron ore is looking incredibly negative, and iron ore prices are already down 50% as a result. Um, copper prices are down 25%, coal prices are down 30%. So this is actually playing into a positive for the commodity price inflation problem the whole globe is facing. Okay, now. So you could say it's a short-term good thing, and maybe the Fed can get away with stopping their rate hiking cycle by the end of the year. But if then this cycles into a full-blown you know, housing crisis, a property sector collapse in China, and then the subsequent kind of recession that that brings, then that would then turn into a very large deflation scenario. It would be an incredibly negative situation from a kind of global GDP point of view. And this is where, yeah, you might, you might see, worst case scenario, you are going to see the Western central banks not only end their tightening cycle, but start their loosening cycle. So like you're telling me rates. to buy stocks again? You, is that <laughs> what you're saying? You're saying I should get in now before I hit my 4,600 and then we go to 5K? Yeah, where are we? Where are we on that, actually? Let's have a quick look because, yeah, I guess it's still, it's still kind of in the balance, isn't it? That's on our 4,600 or 3,700 argument from last week. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that a Chinese, a full-on Chinese uh, proper collapse, that's not good news for anyone. Mm -hmm. I don't care how many times you can cut rates. Right. Well, but that's, let, that's let, the worst case scenario, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let, let's, let's um, finish with the the revenge of the meme stocks. And the reason why is because it's hit the headlines again because of an estimated $1.65 billion 
uh, the short sellers have lost in this month alone. Uh, AMC has rallied about 50% uh, and has pushed mark to market losses for short sellers to around said to be over $650, $650 million. That is uh, similar bets. So it's all the favorites, the Reddit favorites. So Bed Bath and Beyond, GameStop, um, they had surged. Bed Bath and Beyond, you know, 360%. <laughs> uh, GameStop, not quite as much. Um, but short sellers apparently got hit for a billion on the back of that. But the thing that was the real standout article of the week yeah. was a headline in the FT of a 20-year-old university student in the US called Jake Freeman, who made $110 million. This kid's 20, by the way, He's <laughs> in the middle of his studies, made $110 million trading Bed Bath & Beyond. So you, so when I saw that headline, I was like, wow. I was like, this isn't like, you know, oh, I can buy myself a Tesla or something like that. This is 110 million. And so you started reading the article and you're like, oh, okay, so he's an applied mathematics econ student at the University of Southern California. Okay, fine. He acquired, I read, he acquired nearly 5 million shares in Bed Bath & Beyond. And I was like, hang about. Doesn't Bed Bath and Beyond trade at like five bucks a piece or something like that? And he, sorry, he's bought five million shares. <laughs> I was like, how does that work? And then the kicker was his initial stake cost twenty five million dollars. Just to remind you, yep. this is a college student, and he said, "Yeah, I raised most of the money from my mates and my family." Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm hanging out with the wrong kind of people here. 25 well, a, million of your mates and your family. Yeah, it's, a, it's a classic clickbait media yeah. headline, right? 20 year old beauty student makes 110 million. But yeah, this ain't no ordinary uni student who's, who's built up. Well, anyway, he's got ties with Volaris Capital, I think, which is a New Jersey hedge fund that he's been, I guess he's got family ties. I don't know. But he, apparently, he, in his words, he's interns there for years. He's 20 years old. I mean, how, how many years has he interned there? Um, anyway, he's obviously got some ties with them. So, I'm, you know, in, in they're, look, they're obviously from an incredibly wealthy family with a hedge fund sort of capacity and angle, and they've built up, and I'm sure it's not just him, but together with his mates at the hedge fund, I'm sure, built up this 25 million uh, activist investor stake because you were saying, you know, they, they, he sent a letter, didn't he? This he was actually 19 years old at the time. This 19-year-old kid, uh, having built up a five percent stake in the company, then sent an open letter to the to the board, basically massively criticizing the way that they're running their business. And that right here's a list of things that you now need to do to turn it around. Yeah. Um, I'd have liked yeah. to have seen the the face of the, <laughs> of the people sat on the board when they were reading that out. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, one of the things was he, he literally couldn't have timed it better because literally two days later, Bed Bath & Beyond tumbled 20% on Thursday this week. And he, um, the kind of meme stock champion, Ryan Cohen, disclosed on Wednesday evening that he intended to sell his entire stake. And that stake is about 12% of the company. Um, but one of the things here that, you know, with the meme stocks and the whole kind of pump, pump and dump, there's kind of a couple of things here, two concepts really that I was hoping that you could just deconstruct into layman terms. One being that of a short squeeze, which is the kind of the rationale behind the kind of pump, if you like, and why it happens and why they get targeted by the kind of Reddit Wall Street bets kind of threads and then call options. How then, from a, an investment point of view, people try to um, play out this view that they have on a particular company via call options? Yeah, so first one. Um, why do the Reddit gang, why are they targeting these specific companies? And they, they, there's got to be, there, there's a kind of set formula here. Um, so you need a company that's got like two things, right? So number one, a very low free float. So this is describing the number of shares that are in private hands, 
okay? So you want a small number of, a small free float, okay? Because there then the supply of shares is very low, okay? Um, secondly, you want a company that's got a, a very high proportion of short sellers. So that by definition, that means the company is doing really badly or it's got an out of date business model um, like AMC was, was the classic example of that, right? But um, so they're the kind of two things, okay? Really low free, fr free flow and then the hedge fund world, massively short, thinking this stock's going to zero. So this is when then the retail gang get together on, on via Reddit and team up and together, and you can only do it together because as a single retail punter, you're going to have zero impact on the market. But if you can get, hundreds of thousands of retail traders all acting as one, okay, then it's powerful. So what they're doing is they're buying, okay? Even though the company's shockingly bad, and, and to put some stats on that, by the way, um, yeah, Bed Bath & Beyond for quarter two, sales dropped 25%. Um, their net loss widened to 358 million for the quarter. That compared to 51 million last time. Their cash position, this is the most dangerous, their cash position at the start of 2022 was 1 billion. It's now just 107 million. Wow. So their burn rate is just off the sky. So you're like, wow, this thing's going bankrupt, right? Which is why all the hedge fund community is short. So this is where the retail guys are stepping in and buying. And together, they're lifting the price. And the whole point here is they're trying to create what's called a short squeeze. Because if you're short and the price is going up, well, you're losing money, right? And these hedge funds will have risk systems in place that says, look, we can only, we can only hold on here if the loss is X. And if the loss goes above X, right, we're out. So a short squeeze is you're forcing the price so high so that you're forcing hedge funds to cover their short position. That means get out of their short position. As you get out, you buy. So they're trying to force the price up force hedge funds to buy to get out of their shorts. That's more buying power. And because there's such a low free float, the liquidity is really low. So if you all have got, if, if all of a sudden you've got a spike in buying, then it spikes the price ever higher, which of course forces even more hedge funds out. And it's like this snowball effect, okay? So the retail guys are trying to profit by engineering a temporary large spike higher in the share price. And they've done, and this was a phenomenon that came to the fore in 2020 with, with GameStop, right? And AMC and so on. And so now we're kind of having round two of this hmm. situation just this month. Um, so, so Citadel have had a good few weeks then. I, I can't comment. <laughs> um, call options then. How does that yeah. work? Well, call options, I mean, so one way to play this. So a call, a call option is a derivative that um, enables an investor to profit if the share price goes up. If you're long a call option, you can profit from the share price going up. But to be long a call option, you, you need a counterparty to that trade who's short the call option, okay? And it's normally the big financial institutions that are what we call the writers and the sellers of these options, okay? So the short call option position, you profit if the price goes down. You're gonna lose money if the price goes up. Well, no, sorry, you just take the premium and you lose money if the price goes up, right? It's quite a high risk position to be in. Now, the problem is if, you're, if you've bought a call option and the price has rocketed, great, you're gonna exercise that option and you're gonna buy, okay, at the strike price. But your counterparty, therefore, has to sell the shares to you. So as this price has been rising, these financial institutions are having to go ahead and sell stock to the options counterparty who's exercising. But to sell shares, well, you need to own them. So they're actually having to buy shares in order to then sell to fulfill their call option um, obligation. Okay. So again, more buyers, and this is on the financial institution side. And this is the David versus Goliath story where the retail trader is trampling all over 
the big financial institutions and the big hedge funds. And it's a, it's a great story for the media. It's, you know, yeah, it's that David Goliath thing. And yeah, the, uh, and, and Jake Freeman, who's your retail trader in inverted commas, <laughs> Um, has massively profited. There are hedge funds on the right side of this, by the way. So Ryan Cohen, who you mentioned, a big hedge fund guy, he he was he held a he held a twelve percent stake in the company, so much bigger than that student Jake Freeman. Um, and he was buying uh, about a month or so ago. He bought an, an average price of fifteen dollars and thirty four five months ago. Sorry, he bought, um, and he's now sold all of his stake. Um, at a in a price range between eighteen and thirty dollars, uh, so he's made a chunk of money. But his massive sell, along with Jake Freeman's sell together, they they make seventeen percent, right? So they both sold. So now, obviously, that big buying power that drove it all up has turned into big selling power that's now driving it back down. Pump and dump. You see, you see the thing. The thing I have a problem with with this from a from a philosophical point of view is that it's kind of like this anti-suits Wall Street, the hedge funds. I was just having a look. So Bed Bath & Beyond employ about 32,000 people. So yeah. whilst we're all having fun and games and we're talking about pump and dump and let's make 110, let's short squeeze them and teach them a lesson, those hedge funds, there's 30,000 regular Joes who go to work every day to earn their keep and, you know, if you talk about supply chains and you compound that impact that that one firm going down will have. Those guys don't matter, though, do they? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I would say this is like a sideshow, right? It's a short term market manipulation thing. Ultimately, Bed Bath and Beyond are struggling as a business. And what happening, what's happening to their share price doesn't change that. Unless, so two things, some of these staff might own some share options. So then it is good for them. But secondly, if you take, was it the GameStop example? They've kind of reinvented themselves and they're getting involved with NFTs and God knows what, right? So mm. it, it, I don't know with Bed Bath & Beyond, I, 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 is this an opportunity for the board to go, you know what? Our business model's broken. Let's be brave and be radical about how we evolve this business. In, in which case, fine, they might, I don't know, reinvent themselves, turn it around, and their staff are, are safe in their, in their jobs. I think if you didn't have this market event, then Bed Bath & Beyond was going one way, and nothing was going to stop it. It's still going that way, but now you might say there's a tiny chance it might pivot, but still unlikely. Yeah. I don't disagree with what you're saying. It makes complete sense. What I disagree with is then when the Wall Street Bets mob says that they're doing a good thing on the face ah, of humanity, right. which, is, which is playing out just looking at the world through one lens. Well, so, that's the Robin Hood thing, isn't it, about stealing from the rich, the hedge funders, and giving to the poor, the retail investor, your poor Jake Freemans of this world. <laughs> <laughs> So, Poor old Jake. Yeah, I mean, he was really struggling on. before this before this <laughs> this windfall. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, look. With that, we'll wrap things up. Um, as ever, if you enjoyed the show, please do leave us a rating and a review um, on Apple or Spotify. It really does help push this out to as many people as possible. And yeah, hopefully. Everyone um, has had a good week. We'll be back as ever as per normal next week. And uh, yeah, enjoy. Thanks, Piers. Yep. Catch you later.